Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm finishing up a PhD at Michigan. Uh, for some reason, for good or for worse, I decided to do a PhD in really old, dirty jokes. Now, which there are plenty of in Herodotus is a wonderful source for these. So I'd like to talk about a very simple, straightforward question, uh, which is who were the Egyptians that Herodotus met along the Nile? And why did they tell him Pharaoh jokes? Now, Herodotus went to Egypt in the late fifth century as a sort of tourist, probably accompanied by an entourage of other Greeks. And he seems to have encountered a bunch of different storytellers who told him all sorts of stuff. In book two, we have a lot of folklore, many, many tales with really low register content of all varieties. So it sounds like popular culture. And some of it was definitely supposed to be funny, even just at the level of common dirty jokes. You may not have read book two recently, you might not be familiar with it, but if I can tell you uh, just about how some of these stories go. <clears throat> the pharaohs, like other kings in Herodotus, are really questionable figures uh, with strange behaviors. For example, they show up as thieves or drunks. They do bizarre experiments on stolen babies and goats. They're farted at, flashed by people's genitals, they burn their own sons alive. They're outwitted by their clever wives. And occasionally they're the targets of what seem to be just snappy sex jokes. For instance, one of the strangest passages in Herodotus is this little thing right here. Um, and the story goes that um, Pharaoh Cheops was such a wicked king that once since he needed money, he made his own daughter sit in a brothel. He made her charge some amount of silver. They didn't tell me how much. She did what he commanded, but she had her mind set on leaving a monument of her own. So she asked every man who had sex with her to give her a single stone. And they say that's how the pyramid was built from these very stones. The one standing in the middle of the three in front of the great pyramid. Every side of it measures 150 feet. I measured these very pyramids myself. Was this supposed to be funny to somebody? And if so, to who? So here Cheops can't balance his own budget, so he prostitutes his own daughter in this really vicious way. But she comes back and outdoes him by building her own pyramid. There's a real question here about who was supposed to be the hero of the story. In the Greek, there seems to be some conversation going on where you have this aside. They didn't tell me how much. It's, I put it in orange on the slide there. It implies that somebody's near Herodotus in the audience asking how much. So this is a performance atmosphere. It's a small group and there's interaction as this joke is told. It sounds almost as if somebody's asking which pyramid they're supposed to be looking at as a bunch of Greek tourists are sort of pointing their fingers in the wrong direction. And somebody tells them, oh, it's the middle one. It's that one, she built that one, right? So my question is, where did this come from? Were Greeks just a bunch of misogynists making stuff up about some exotic foreign princess they wanted to slut shame? with ethnically insensitive humor? Were they projecting themselves out onto Egypt like a mirror for their own sexual humor? Or was this actually an Egyptian joke that would have been funny to priests, to women, or possibly even prostitutes, the sort who might attend the sort of drinking parties where this kind of material would be told? It's delivered in a very snappy way. And Herodotus picked it up and kept it for some reason. The question is why? The passage has been almost completely ignored for any of its value for history. And I find this so strange. Um, so people who write books on history of the pyramid builders and the late period of Egypt, even in the last five or 10 years, you won't find this joke in scholarship very often. They generally just put this stuff in a footnote and run past it quickly and then move on because it's just folklore, like some silly thing that's not really worth our time. Well, I beg to differ. I don't think Herodotus was making stuff up. Uh, not only was this joke Egyptian, but it was coming out of very old traditions of Egyptian comedy where the pharaohs encounter divine women um, who were smarter than they were all the time. Um, <clears throat> priests have been making fun of the pharaohs and their sex lives for a really long time with gender humor in all sorts of ways. And this is just a little glimpse of that traditional material. The fact that somebody passed this on to Herodotus might tell us a lot about what life was like around the pyramids in the everyday lives of normal people who had to deal with tourists, who had to deal with Greeks. I mean, they were telling jokes. So it's fascinating that they had this relationship. Um, so it's not like Egyptians loved talking about the pyramids though. Um, 
Herodotus tells us that they hated the pyramids because they were giant monoliths to tyranny and hubris of an authoritarian. Cheops made all the people work for no reason and starved them all just so his family could have big piles of stones for themselves. So Herodotus says Egyptians wouldn't even say Cheops' name, they hated him so much. <clears throat> There's this strange little passage um, that people often pass by and, and nothing's been written about it at all. Um, where he says Egyptians despise these kings so much, they won't even say their names. Instead, they named the pyramids after a shepherd, Philetus, who happened to pastor some sheep in the area at that time. Now, Philetus sounds a little weird to anybody who has any experience with livestock. Manure that follows in the footsteps of shepherds around the world is commonly heaped up into pyramids to store fuel for long periods of time. It's no different around the Middle East. Egyptian farmers today still calculate the amount of manure available for a season mathematically using the geometry of a pyramid. Sheep are animals whose defecations tend to look like little stones stacked on top of one another, as you can see in this wonderful graphic. Um, so I'd like to suggest that uh, Herodotus was talking to somebody nearby who had, a, uh, if he was talking to anybody nearby who had any experience with farming or sheep or goats, or actually was a shepherd, it's not hard to catch the whiff of a joke here that was meant to demean the pyramids as big piles of sheep shit. As Greek tourists do all this Pythagorean style math to figure out how big the pyramids are, it could have been quite funny to an interior audience for completely different reasons. So this was probably resentful local Egyptian humor about monarchy that some farmer told in passing to Herodotus who totally loved it and wrote it down. I mean, I think Herodotus is pretty understated and very tongue in cheek and it would be really hard to detect whether or not this is supposed to be a funny line in Greek, but I bet it is. And it's sometimes, it's something readers have missed for a really long time, but here we are. Um, and to that extent, I think this um, humorous material has value. To tell a dirty manure joke or a prostitute joke about a figure of cultural authority like Cheops is actually a really big deal. You can't get away with that sort of thing in most, in authoritarian societies, you'll get locked up or censored or killed. It's the political equivalent of spraying graffiti on a monument. In fact, there actually is some graffiti on a monument on the giant foot of Ramses the Great, uh, chiseled onto it by some really naughty Egyptians who were traveling with Greeks together as mercenaries in the same army around the year 590. Um, this was a bunch of soldiers who thought they were being funny. And as they passed by, they decided to make a joke on this monument. Um, so here it is uh, written, written out and we don't bother with what it's actually saying, but the words at the end, Matthew P. Dillon has this wonderful, argue, uh, wonderful article on this. Let's say it was written by Pelikos, son of Udemos. And what that means is Chisel, son of nobody. So that's probably a reference to Odysseus whose name was nobody as he outwitted the Cyclops. So Egyptians and Greeks together were familiar with Odysseus and his tricky ways and blemishing these old monuments of pharaohs as they passed by in armies. They were writing their own little history all over the big monument. So it's no surprise that, that there were really close humorous interactions and friendly relationships between Greeks and Egyptians as they looked at these immense tyrants and made fun of them together in stories and jokes and tales and fantasized about toppling or stealing or farting on them, just like Odysseus might have. Um, so I have a few main points to make that we'll walk through before looking at a specific passage that I think uh, it, everyone will find pretty interesting. And I'd like to hear, you know, as we open discussion, uh, hear some of your thoughts on that passage later. <clears throat> First of all, uh, Egyptians had a sense of humor. Now, I shouldn't have to say this. It's actually ridiculous that I even need to say this. But the history of Egyptology and classics is really about white men going into Egypt and trying to explain everything and just missing a lot of the culture. Through all of that, any presence for Egyptian humor was just gone, right? People still think that comedy was a Greek and Roman invention, which is just wrong. It's as if people everywhere don't laugh at stuff. It's an accident of colonialism that Aristophanes and Plautus had huge celebrity, but nobody else around the Mediterranean was capable of doing anything fun. Now, in classics, you get the idea that humor existed less and less the further you got from Athens, which is incorrect. Um, a lot of classical authors couldn't handle the notion that people like Egyptians could make fun of themselves and their own bodies and their own world and their kings, especially the gods. Um, 
Plato, Aristotle, and Plutarch, they all tried as hard as they could to reduce or to clean up Egyptian mythology because it was out of control. How sexual and animalistic and primal it was. So our classical sources for, for any of this are, are really unfortunate and very skewed in the serious direction toward philosophy and away from festivity or comedy or folklore or fun, which was a huge part of ancient life. So Plutarch hated Herodotus. He would never come to this Zoom meeting. If we could invite Plutarch here, he would say no, because uh, he hated Herodotus because of all these Pharaoh stories. They, they were very offensive to him. You know, they sounded so anti-Greek, so offensive to Platonism, especially the, the fact that animals could be gods. That's just not okay to Platonism. So Egyptian myth really just didn't fit with Greek philosophy in some ways. In the history of Western colonialism, Egyptians became sterilized and revered and sort of mysticized as this society of hermetic sages, secretive and enlightened monks who never smile and never laugh and don't drink wine and never have sex with anybody. And they sit around just being wise all day long with glowing bald heads or something like aliens, which is just completely false. It's a projection of what Romans and Greeks wanted to see in themselves trying to appropriate Egypt into their self-image as high-minded philosophers. So what's actually funny to me in all this is the history of prudes who were afraid of Egyptian humor and all they could think about was how different and exotic the Egyptians were rather than just being people like anybody else. And thanks to religion or colonialism, they canceled it out. They didn't like what they were reading. So our project here is to try and recover some of it with help from Herodotus. Um, to decolonize or disentangle a really unfortunate history in classics of ignoring Egypt for all its brilliant culture. Um, we have to undo the idea that Greeks and Romans were the only ones who were funny, and this ugly classical image of the Egyptians as static or homogenous, when actually they were very diverse and often had a great sense of humor and a lot of awareness and involvement in Athenian politics. I mean, they fought huge wars together, they lived together, they married each other and had kids, they were real people with lives and families and personalities and imperfections and loves and hatreds. So Herodotus is actually very valuable for undoing and decolonizing because in some ways he wasn't guilty of it. He was there listening and writing and actually preserved stuff like dirty jokes that any philosopher would have immediately gotten rid of on the spot. So we have to assume that Egyptians were actually quite fond of Herodotus. You don't invite people you dislike to get together at a dinner party and tell funny stories. Um, second point, again, lots of people visited Egypt. I, that's another point I shouldn't have to make, but in classics, the impression you get is that Delphi is the belly button of the world, and Egypt was this secret society of monks over here somewhere doing all sorts of hidden weird things. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, people all around the Mediterranean had been visiting Egypt for hundreds of years before Herodotus. It was a really busy international place. There was absolutely nothing unusual about some Greek dude wandering around and asking people for information about stuff. Maybe he stood out a little bit, but you know this was an everyday world. Storytellers along the Nile were probably prepared, if not counting on tourists, stopping by and asking dumb questions about birds and fish and about the pyramids. And they probably would have had all sorts of material for these interactions. It would have been very entertaining if some of it was just untrue or meant to trick the tourists. One thing they could do is brush tourists off with dirty pimp jokes or lie to them or anything, depending on the person. These were storytellers in busy areas. People were probably not there to provide information to Herodotus. That's not their job. They just live there. Egypt and Herodotus day was a hot spot for travel, tourism, festivals, work, trading, food, beer, especially Egyptian beer, cultural and mixing across the Mediterranean, marriages, raising families, exotic vacations for Greeks looking to buy trinkets like scarabs to take home, but also darker things like mercenary wars and migrants driven to escape from them, the lives of slaves and prostitutes we know very little about, but they were everywhere. Prostitution would have been a big element, especially among you know a, a million other sorts of interactions we can only imagine because they're missing from the record. Probably Herodotus was outside of these giant temples or tourist traps, like the pyramids with some forbidden spaces, but the sort of surrounding area where people would gather by the dozens or hundreds with lots of traffic every day, um, they would have been extremely populated and diverse with lots of different languages going on. So it's no wonder he heard all this stuff in real time and it went right in his ear and he wrote it down. 
Third point, an Egyptian priest could have been just about any Egyptian man. It's not like Herodotus was engaging with sages and mystics and official lore keepers in charge of sacred scrolls. Maybe to some extent, but again, that's an illusion that the philosophers created about Egypt and that they're all a bunch of secretive mystics. Well, not at all. Um, something we know from looking at Egyptian documents is that priesthoods were very common and totally temporary. They're like three or four months a year, so lots of people cycled in and out. They were well-paid positions that were very competitive, and they were actually hot commodities. <clears throat> There's one Egyptian text from around Herodotus's time uh, that's a sort of prose history that describes an elderly priest squabbling with these younger guys who are trying to steal his priesthood and his inheritance and his prestige, even to the extent that he's beaten mercilessly and thrown under a fallen tower. His sons are murdered and his house burnt to the ground just because other priests want to steal his position as a priest. At one point, he's locked up with a bunch of prisoners and the guards outside get too drunk and he escapes. And all sorts of stories about what it's like to be an Egyptian priest that sound very, very similar to some of the stories in Herodotus, where there are things like drunken guards. Um, so these were complex communities that were diverse. There was a huge amount of bickering and strife about who got to be a priest. Um, Herodotus could have spoken with anyone with any motive. There are legal documents prosecuting local peasants who would actually fake their way into the priesthood and get in trouble for pretending to be priests. So it's pretty clear that it was a permeable barrier. Um, Herodotus informants may or may not have even been priests. They could have been farmers or blacksmiths or beer brewers or craftsmen or even actual thieves. They would go and be a priest for a while and even pretend to be one and end up talking to Greeks randomly and tell them whatever they wanted. Uh, fourth point, household storytelling easily trickled in and out of the priesthood. So probably workers and women and children were telling all sorts of common household stories about the pharaohs and how they pimped their daughters and things like that as they would do. And this content made its way to Herodotus through the, through the priests and scribes because they liked to hear these tales at home and they wanted to share them with a foreigner. This folklore shows up in plenty of Egyptian literary texts of really high registers, but they're usually like a series of clever little stories um, sort of strung together and meant to be performed for small gatherings um, in a fun way with obscenity and sound effects and puns and bodily humor about things like especially adultery. There are tons of Egyptian adultery tales. So women and children probably loved these, uh, particularly about the pharaohs who are sort of historical celebrities. Um, it's something they did all the way back to the Middle Kingdom is to write playful narratives about the sex lives of the rich and the famous, especially Cheops, who we met earlier. The Cheops sex thing goes back for hundreds of years before Greeks were even in Egypt. It's likely that people around these tourist, tourist traps knew Greek uh, well enough to actually translate some of this traditional material to Herodotus right into his ear. So what we have in some of these tales in book two are oral narratives that he wrote down. Uh, he did a pretty good job too, from what we can tell. A lot of it was probably originally the domain of women and children in the household is what I'm saying here. And the priests learned to tell to visiting Greeks for one reason or another. A fifth point, um, Herodotus spoke to diverse informants in warm and convivial atmospheres. Uh, there are different versions of tales in book two. So you get the same, like uh, the, the king uh, prostituting his daughter, for example. It shows up in different, uh, different folk tales because it's a motive that you can creatively sort of tailor to whatever story you're telling. So he was, what we can tell from that is that he was talking to all sorts of different people. He had different informants. Um, there's nothing really controversial about this point. I, I just think it's, uh, it's interesting that some of the stories that people told him were very elegant and long and must have been performed with lots of, uh, lots of time and lots of wine and good company and, and time to sit and, and listen to a good story. But others must have been rude or short or flippant or even just lying right to his face. The Cheops tale particularly is very short and very quick, very snappy. Around the time Herodotus was visiting, um, you know, Greeks and Egyptians had been fighting together as allies against the Persians. And from what we can tell, they were very close and doing all sorts of things, by namely having sex with each other and making babies and getting married. I mean, it's no surprise if Herodotus was in somebody's home or at a symposium where they were drinking and telling jokes. So on the one hand, we have a long and extended narrative like Rhampsinitis, the, uh, the very the longest narrative in book two. It's really beautifully crafted and, and it's meant for a long sitting. 
probably with breaks for food. Um, when tales like this are told in the, in the modern world, uh, in traditional folk forms, there's always breaks for cigarettes and food and, and things like that. Uh, because they're, they're, it takes a while to get through the story. So um, on the other hand, you have something somebody on the street could have just made up on the spot, you know, like a joke about a pimp. So he's in different contexts. And he, as he travels, you can sort of detect his changing, um, his changing journey and his encounters with different personalities as you read underneath some of his tales, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, obsessive, uh, here's another point. Obsessive Egyptomania was satirized in Egyptian popular culture for centuries before Herodotus. Local Egyptians along the Nile thought Egyptomaniacs were hilarious and silly. Um, somebody, this is like somebody looking for artifacts or magic because they're too curious for their own good. This is the, the real substance of Egyptian folk storytelling, especially curiosity. So if you've read the Roman African novel, Apuleius Golden Ass, from the second century AD, the main character Lucius is this sort of dumb Roman guy who turns himself into a donkey using magic. Well, that novel is, it's an Egyptian story if there ever was one. I mean, the old Egyptian material from before Herodotus and long before Apuleius is really the same sort of narrative. It's always about some idiot fooling around with magic because he's a pretentious philosophy major, but he's also really horny and wants power that he doesn't really deserve. Um, is this typical Egyptian narrative? Uh, the, the comic main character is always looking for like the secret chambers or the hidden book. And he's an Egyptomaniac trying to find things or gain hidden secrets. The process of not finding it or getting into serious trouble along the way with the divines, with the gods especially, is the sort of heart of Egyptian humor. So I really wanna make this point about Herodotus that curiosity as a sort of motive of a sort of comic uh, uh, form of narrative was at the heart of African and world storytelling long before he set foot in Egypt. Um, Egyptians really loved these sort of stock characters, just like Lucius, the golden ass, who sneak around asking questions and trying to figure things out and, you know, looking at old monuments and trying to read hieroglyphs. Uh, many of the Egyptian texts from around Herodotus' time are actually satires of, philo of philology. They're making fun of a solitary scribe who sits around trying to gain ancient wisdom or to do ancient history. They're really similar to Greek comedy figures. So, so from Aristophanes, these kind of like silly old men who transgress the boundaries of gender or knowledge because they're really horny and they want to like sneak into a temple or something like this and find out what women are doing. These are like Greek comedy kind of uh, plot lines. And it's, it's quite funny. Um, see them get into sticky situations and then have their hubris sort of cut down. Now, so if Herodotus is coming out of a world where this is Greek comedy, he would have loved the Egyptian material because it's very, very similar. Um, so exact, for example, um, there's the famous text, Setna 1. We'll have a look at this in a moment. It's extremely complex, um, but you have to uh, you have to read it. It's probably one of the most interesting texts of the ancient world, especially if you want to understand what sort of traditions Herodotus was dealing with and encountering when he was along the Nile. So Steve Vinson has this wonderful recent book out about it. I strongly recommend everybody in classics just read a few chapters in this book because it's very accessible and very um, entertaining, and it gives you a, a taste of Egyptian popular literature in a really fun way. So I thought we could just read a short summary of part of this plot line. I'm not doing it justice with this, but here's how part of this plot line goes. So the son of Ramses the Great, that's his name is Setna, is obsessed with a magic book. To find it, he descends into a tomb where he meets two ghosts, Nanafer Kapta and his wife, Uaret. She, the wife, warns these two men about their curiosity. But of course, her foolish, so she, she says her foolish husband killed their whole family when he sought the book himself a long time ago. So regardless of her warning, uh, Setna and Nanifer Kapta decide to play a board game to decide who gets the book. The ghost accuses Setna of cheating at the board game and bashes him over the head with it over and over and over again so hard that it sinks him into the ground up to his penis. Now Setna manages to steal the book, but in return he's cursed with a nightmare. In a dream he sees a sexy priestess of the cat goddess Tabubu and desperately wants to have sex with her. 
Supposing that he's actually going to be able to do this, he offers her a small amount of silver as if she were a cheap prostitute. Rejected in a clever series of double or even triple entendres, these are, Vincent points out uh, these, pun, these brilliant puns going on here. She actually tells him to go do it to himself. Setna is finally invited into her house, as it were. Now, Setna does everything he can to persuade Tabubu to have sex. He signs over his whole family fortune. He even allows her to kill his children by hurling them out the window where they're eaten by dogs and cats. When he reaches out to start actually getting on with having sex, Tabubu's jaw drops to the floor in a scream. This is a sort of trope scene. This is a very comedy, uh, common um, scene of, of, of surprise. And Setna slaps, uh, snaps awake. He's lying naked in the middle of the street in front of the Pharaoh himself with his penis stuck in a chamber pot. Now, this is obviously the stuff of comedy at some level. People in Egypt would have known all about these traditions of Setna storytelling. It would have been popular stuff performed in the evenings or monthly festivals all the time. A guy gets his penis stuck in a chamber pot. It's typical folk humor. You can find this stuff anywhere in the world in folklore traditions. Um, Herodotus was really interested that the Egyptians were making fun of men's hubris. You know, an essential message of the histories is that you better be careful what you ask for. You better be careful how you interact with the divine. And that's just as much apparent in Egyptian literature as well. So they harmonized really well on this point in terms of humor. Greeks and Egyptians shared a lot of comic wisdom together. And I think there's this real symbiosis going on between Herodotus and his informants around the Mediterranean. Um, seventh point, priests were stereotypes of popular humor and fantasy traditions in Egypt. So we have plenty of texts where priests are fictional. They're the main characters and heroes in different sorts of plots. And they're often very funny to an Egyptian audience. Sometimes the priests almost remind us of Homer's Odysseus as sort of crafty, but ultimately really questionable and almost sleazy uh, guys going on this quest to get laid. And the women, much, much like Penelope, are usually the heroes of the stories, or at least the ones who have a brain and know what's going on and have some dignity. So Egyptians probably knew all about and had heard Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and had actually written their own versions of these epics. Uh, and we have these in Demotic where priests are the heroes, just like Achilles and Patroclus, and they fight epic battles with each other. So Egyptians were capable of all sorts of genres of literature, and there was a two-way transmission between Greek and Egyptian uh, culture. They knew all about Greek lore and Greek storytelling. In popular comedy, the, the priests have labels like a really wise man or a very good scribe, much like Odysseus is man of many ways. But through the course of the story, you uh, realize that this is ironic. They weren't wise at all. And actually the decisions they make are totally questionable doing things like trying to sleep with the neighbor's wife or steal from somebody or misuse magic to gain power in all sorts of ways. The first written version of the Sack of Troy, if you are familiar with this from Homer, um, uh, is actually an Egyptian humor text from the Middle Kingdom. It's called the Capture of Joppa. That's like a thousand years before Homer, as far as we can tell, where a bunch of drunken Egyptian soldiers smuggle their way into a city in wine baskets with some slapstick humor involved. It's definitely a playful text. So the Egyptian relationship with Homer in terms of popular culture is really interesting, uh, but priests themselves were probably comic stereotypes. It's very possible that if Herodotus asked to talk to a priest, he could have gotten somebody with a little bit of attitude, a little bit of salt, drawing on these popular traditions. It's like if someone wandered around Italy asking to talk to the Pope and locals instead said things like, I'm the Pope, or they drew upon all these jokes about the Pope's hat that they knew. And in some ways, um, it was a way of brushing off a tourist. This is the sort of thing that happens at a festival along the Nile. You get all sorts of interactions between people. And Herodotus had a, a kind of difficult time figuring out when people were uh, just joking with him or they were telling him true facts. Um, Eighth point, so some Egyptians knew Greek science and sophistry well enough to make fun of it with curious king stories and Herodotus loved it. Uh, now, Matthew Christ has written a lot about this notion of inquiring kings and Herodotus. I think he was on this, he was on the helpline a, a while ago. So you can listen to him talk about that. But we've been talking about these comic Egyptian stereotypes that are very similar to Odysseus in some ways. 
were very curious, too curious for their own good. Well, this kind of folklore became connected to the pharaohs as imperialists and tyrants who inquire into the boundaries of the universe. They try to control everything and know everything, and they try to dominate everybody. So priests who had to suffer under their government used a lot of this kind of Odysseus humor to make fun of the pharaohs and their stupidity, and their, especially their sexual failures, cutting them down to size. And when tourists would ask for history about the pharaohs, they, they are asking for the great man version of history. Instead, the locals would, wouldn't tell them anything about the pharaohs, but provide all these scurrilous narratives. This is fascinating. The, the reason these tales survived in Herodotus is, is really fascinating. So Egyptians hated the men who built the pyramids. We've talked about that. Um, they despised the pharaohs for carving up the land and trying to control the Nile. So you have, for example, a pharaoh like Samaticus, who wants to find out the earliest human language. Maybe you, if you're into Herodotus, you might recognize this story. It's the very first one at book two. So he steals babies from local people. He puts them in a shack with goats and he locks them away without any human interaction until they grow up. When they come out of the shack, the first word they say is bakos, which in Phrygian means bread. So he concludes that the Phrygians are the oldest race on the planet. Of course, this is a stupid experiment. I don't know if, you have, if you've looked at this passage and thought about it, but the joke is that bakos actually sounds a lot like a goat going bakos. So, Samatik, so there's a sound effect here and Samatikis is actually kind of an idiot. He's just raised little goat people and he came to the totally wrong conclusion. He actually managed to undercut the ancient lineage of all the Egyptians uh, by mis misunderstanding his own experiment. So when we read the demotic tales, there are lots of these sorts of stories in comedy, particularly about magicians learning to speak like animals. It's very likely that this was actually a form of Egyptian story. In fact, the way I read it is as, as a satire of Greek inquiry. Samatikas was famous for loving the Greeks and welcoming them to Egypt. So it's not hard to believe that there was some political humor going on in popular storytelling. Um, stories about wise Greeks traveling to Egypt may have actually been fictions, like popular satires of Egyptologists, Solon, Pythagoras, Plato. Um, so according to legend, Plato went and visited the Egyptians and learned everything he knew after 13 years. Uh, Strabo and some other authors write about things like this. And the problem with narratives like this is that in the last few years, classicists, you know, we can read Egyptian documents translated where Plato and his, uh, his visit to Egypt to meet a priest um, it's almost as if it's, it's like he's meeting a priest who's a stock figure in comedy. It sounds actually more like a satire of a platonic dialogue than an actual meeting of any historical value. So let's actually turn to this. Let's actually turn to this figure that Plato supposedly met when he went to Egypt. This is the, this is the person that Plato apparently got all of his wisdom from and learned astrology. Um, so there's another text that's called, we can call it, there's a lot of different names, but we can call it 70 Tales of Good and Bad Women. Um, and this is Egyptian. It's from probably was definitely floating around in Herodotus's time, but the preserved versions are from centuries later. Uh, they're collections of oral uh, folklore, but the story goes like this. This is the frame story. Patisse, a high-ranking priest, talks in the courtyard of his house with a ghost, trying to find out how long he has to live. In response, the ghost laughs at him. Annoyed, Patisse casts a spell on the ghost to force it to tell him. It turns out he's only got 40 days left. He becomes severely depressed, a broken man with a sad heart, and has to prepare his own funeral. But he needs money, so he decides to try to sell access to hidden books he happens to know about in the temple to Heliopolis in exchange for 500 pieces of silver. So he's almost like a sort of Greek sophist selling wisdom for money. Um, oops. So Harius, the uh, official at the temple, denies him the money, but Patisse uses magic to enchant a wax cat and falcon and commands them to run across town to go into Harius's house to chase each other around and make a mess out of it wreaking havoc. Harius is terrified, intimidated, and gives in for double the amount. Petit spends the money creating wax baboons who will write down 35 stories of good women and 35 of bad women. Petit dies and his wife, Sacminifret, visits him on a daily basis to hear a story. 
So there's a story told every day to her. Every day the sun god speaks to her through a baboon and tells these stories. So in another text that survives, this is the Patisse who actually meets Plato and teaches him about the stars. This is one of um, those connections where we hear about wise Greeks going to Egypt and learning everything about science or math. Well, a lot of that was actually coming out of popular culture where probably these were Egyptian um, traditions kind of like the Arabian Nights where there, there were collections of folk tales that were bundled together and, and you'd hear occasionally Plato appears in one of them. So one of these, what's really interesting for us is the Herodotus, uh, Herodotus people is one of these adultery tales that Patisse told, has told to his wife actually shows up in Herodotus written in Greek. Um, so most of the 70 stories are about sex and adultery. For example, you get a story about a young guy who, climb, who comes home and climbs up a tree and sees his mother sleeping with a local soldier and the rest of the plot seems to be how she tries to save her, you know, reputation or something. We don't know it's lost. It sounds a lot like Greek or Roman comedy, but in any case, they're supposed to be divided into stories about good women and who behave like virtuous women and bad women who break the rules. And that itself is pretty questionable because it seems that much of the humor in these stories is at the expense of the men who tend to like fantasize about what their women ought to be like. So these are probably, to some extent at least, women's folk tales that were collected into a, you know, a, a unit. So um, the, the, the version in Herodotus that shows up, you might be familiar, oops, you might be familiar with this from book two. Um, it's about Pharos, the son of Sesostris, and now the story is about the rising of the Nile. So it goes like this. Uh, when Sesostris died, Pharos inherited the kingdom. He didn't perform any military feats, but he was blinded in the following incident. During his reign, the river flooded over the land to a greater extent than ever before, to a height of 27 feet. And when it overflowed the fields, the wind drove it to surge in waves like a sea. They say that this king in reckless arrogance took a spear and cast it into the eddies in the middle of the river. And immediately afterward, his eyes were afflicted with disease and he became blind. His blindness continued for 10 years until in the 11th, there was an oracular response from the city of Buto stating that the duration of his punishment was over and he would regain his sight by washing his eyes with the urine of a woman who had only been with her own husband, having no experience of other men. So he first tried this with the urine of his own wife, but this failed to just restore his sight. He then tried all other women in Egypt, one after the other, and when he finally regained his sight, he brought uh, together into the city, which is now called Red Soil, all the women he'd tried with except for the one whose urine had restored his sight. When they were gathered together there, he set them all on fire along with the city itself. But he took as his wife the woman whose urine he had washed his eyes and regained his sight. Um, so the demotic version, the Egyptian version of this story uh, that we can we can now look at as sort of a to understand the, the Egyptian traditions about writing this kind of content. It's very very similar structurally. The narrative is very very close, and it goes like this: where Pharaoh rages over a woman. So this time the Nile doesn't, doesn't rise and fall. It's not, it's not the water that's here. It's, he rages over a woman that there's a chance he wants to have sex with her and her husband is in the way. And so he throws something and kills her husband. The woman shrieks. Pharaoh allows her to, buy, to bury her dead husband, but then he's, he's cursed with blindness. He has a dream and sees an oracle. He has to wash his eyes with the tears from a virtuous woman who has only slept with her own husband. The wives of his generals are forced to weep. They've all been cheating on their husbands. Pharaoh's own wives are forced to weep. They've all been cheating on him. His son finds at least one virtuous woman in all of Egypt for him, so Pharaoh regains his sight. So the presence of um, women here and their ability to sexually express themselves and sleep with whoever they want is really interesting. Um, in my reading, this is really similar to something like the Oedipus cycle, which is like a detective story where this pharaoh has to find out about the horrors of his own world with the irony of losing his sight. 
Um, the fact that Herodotus may have tailored this passage so that women originally forced to weep, to cry out of their eyes, now become a bunch of women pissing all over the Pharaoh's face should probably tell us something. Now, of course, urine has you know, medical properties. There's a chance this wasn't intended to be entertaining at all. But we can only wonder to what extent Herodotus was tailoring this passage from what he heard, or if there was some accident in translation or something. Um, if it, the, the, the urine there has the sense of being somewhat funny because it's the Pharaoh, even if you know it's a sort of bizarre scene. In Egyptian literature, this sort of bodily pouring out is a, it can be a pattern or a sign that a king is uh, wicked and that his reign is coming to an end. It's very, uh, um, it's very prophetic in the way that it depicts a really bad ruler who's about to get what's coming to him. And his curiosity, his, his detective discovery is part of that journey to find a woman who's only slept with her own husband and there are none or there's only one. The implication being that this is a really you know, unattractive and non-functional court of men uh, that's failing to reproduce. So this is an essential sort of form of mythology too, where the trickster goddess Isis, for example, in Egyptian myth, interferes in the lives of evil men as representations of Seth. And the Nile waters were in mythology, they were kind of sourced from the tears of Isis. So this might go some distance to explain why these women are are weeping. They're supposed to be divine representations of Isis. Um, so the, the rising of the Nile, the waters of the Nile, and the goddess Isis are, are closely related. So there wasn't that much lost in translation. There's some underlying mythology at play here about the divinity of these women as representations of the goddess. Their sexuality, their free choice to sleep around was actually sort of a good thing. And the Pharaoh is almost certainly the antagonist full of rage and emotion. So I'd like to propose that in these stories, it's the women who are sort of the main characters. Uh, just like Cheops' daughter above, the, the general Egyptian pattern in comedy is that women are sort of divine representations of Isis. And through their emotion and their sexuality and their experience and their suffering, we're meant to learn about evil Pharaohs and their hubris, right? So you can totally understand why Herodotus would have loved this kind of co popular content and kept it because it fits right into his democratic mentality. Um, so my last uh, sort of bundle of points that I'd like to make is just in some, <clears throat> Egyptian folk humor really complemented Herodotus's historiography. Uh, Egyptian pop culture in everyday life was far more democratic than has been thought. Like the, I, I really do think a lot of these, this stuff was sourced out of popular Egyptian culture. And it, it makes sense when we look at a lot of the demotic that corroborates this. So for example, you get, you get themes in this stuff that's like the tyrant's failure to control his emotions and to use his brain or to have any forethought. The tyrant's failure to control women to, to, to their freedom and their sexuality comes up against him. Um, the tyrant's failure to gain perfect and everlasting knowledge or magic. His failure to, especially to control fate or to control oracles, right? Or to imperialize the entire universe and, and dominate nature. These are subjects of comedy in Egyptian literature just as much as they are Greek sort of notions of wisdom that made their way into philosophy. In other forms of expression uh, around the world, these were forms of comedy. These were forms of humor and, and folklore um, for a really long time before Herodotus. So, I would say that rather than reading Herodotus as a sort of mirror or a mirage or a sort of orientalizing Greek going in and planting himself on this civilization, you can recognize a lot of learning and, and two-way communication and comic symbiosis, listening and empathy, empathy of traditions and popular, popular cultures. Um, finally, you know, why should anyone outside of Herodotian studies care about this, right? in the wider world of classics or, or later liter literary traditions or anything else. Well, these short stories that we find in fragments in Herodotus had a massive, massive effect on world literature, completely underestimated how, how powerful the Egyptian form of storytelling became, particularly through the figure of Alexander the Great. Now, the sort of typical form of these stories is that a curious elite transgresses the divine as he's seeking after sex, knowledge, money, magic. These are funny plot lines. It's the essence of kind of world comedy. Through a series of bodily or animal or gender inversions, he 
metamorphoses, he changes, and he sort of earns empathy and earns his own comeuppance. So it, when you look at something like the Alexander Romance, which is the, probably the most popular text in the ancient world, it was everywhere. It's in something like 55 different languages at this point. Um, the life of Alexander is sort of undergirded by a lot of these popular Egyptian comic narratives that in their original form were making fun of pharaohs, making, mocking their sex lives and their arrogance and their hubris and their tendency to go to the boundaries of the universe and take everything and control people and colonize societies. Um, th that humor is there and it's been kind of changed over time. Um, obviously this stuff is hugely in influential with um, Apuleius's Golden Ass, for example, uh, which is an Egyptian tale that's, uh, that was actually written by an, an African Apuleius who is, you know, says he's writing with an Egyptian uh, a pen. So I, I'd really like to propose that some of the material in Herodotus is useful for understanding the popular under, under lore or, or underlying traditions that uh, a lot of these original, um, these, these, these Greek, uh, Greek and Roman novels were drawing from.